This is David Paul Brown. If you don't know him by name, you certainly know him for his distinctive look and habit of appearing all over YouTube in various musical projects. Only a few years ago, this guy was basically everywhere on indie YouTube. But as of today, he's been missing for over three years. And not some, oh, he stopped uploading but still shit posts on Twitter kind of disappearance. I mean, total erasure from the online world. And the reason for this lies at the center of a twisted web of manipulation and abuse, the true extent of which is still hidden from the world. This video will include references to some pretty dark topics, so here's your verbal warning for that. But if you're ready to carry on, let's take a look at the life and times of David Paul Brown, otherwise known as Boy in a Band. David was born in the quaint little English village of Telford. However, his family would soon forgo the gentle streams and rolling moors of Britain for the extravagant skyscrapers and blistering heat of Dubai, where Dave alongside his sister, Hannah, would spend their formative years. It was in this environment, surrounded by strict rules and ancient tradition, that David first developed a desire to break social norms and express himself both in interests and physical appearance. Later on, David would become somewhat renowned for his distaste of the modern education system, and it's presumably here in Dubai where these opinions were formed Formulated, even if at the time he didn't know how to express his thoughts. One anecdote he provides is him being required to cut his hair short, despite such an action being completely unrelated to his academic progression. But when I went to secondary school, boys were not allowed to have long hair. I remember being so freaking sad about that and having this conversation with my mom like- After his family returned to the UK, he would attend university where he studied computer science. Whilst at uni, he realized how creepy he probably looked to other people, so he would refine his appearance into the iconic look we know today. That's not a dig at Dave, that's just every guy's freshest experience. <laughs> Man, my hair started off naff, like really bad. Like nerdy, failed Kurt Cobain no self-awareness bad. He grew his hair long and started listening to metal music, pretty, pretty rad. Whilst a lot of young people in their teenage years find themselves acting out against their parents, Dave seemed to have the full support of his mother for any expressions of the self, with her paying for him to get his hair dyed, thus inadvertently creating the most iconic piece of his brand. Uh, my mom paid for me and my sister as a Christmas present to go and get our hair dyed. And these two freaking women, I swear they were sadistic as hell. Like they did all the dyeing and everything. And then once they'd done it, they all just started brushing without any concern for how painful it is. To assist with his burgeoning musical passion, he somehow got a home studio set up. I don't know if it was self-funded or if his parents paid for it, but either way, it was a major step forward for the quality of his work. I'll quickly say here, I have no musical knowledge, so, so if I sound like a fool, please let me know below. I don't want to miss genre, anyone, hey? Eh? Get it? It's like, it's like misgender, but like music, music, music genre. Sorry, that wasn't very funny. In 2007, Dave joined a sick fucking indie band named You and What Army, and they would do the usual student band chicanery, mainly playing small venues and student events. They clearly gained some kind of following, receiving praise from multiple early 2000s rock magazines, citing them as a notable upcoming musical act, despite the fact that they were unsigned and would never find themselves attached to a label. They made a few EPs with the help of Dave's home studio, and during his time with the band, he would create the Boy in a Band YouTube channel. Here, he began to upload content relating to his music career, mostly of a comedic nature, satirizing the music industry and various musical genres. But he would still put out some serious music videos, as well as tutorials and reviews for various musical computer programs. The channel had no official link to the band, but the other members could often be seen cameoing on it, and would frequently advertise their shows, making it a pretty effective marketing tool for their tours and upcoming projects. This week, my band Yumot Army released our new EP for free. We decided we needed an original title that really kind of expressed who we are, you know. So uh, we went with, you ready for it? You and what army? However, in 2014, before the release of their first studio album, the band would break up. This boy was no longer in a band. The details of why the band split are still unknown, at least to my knowledge. I like to imagine Dave was too anti-establishment for the other cleans, you know, they couldn't handle the brown style. Rock's in danger of becoming stale, he's taking it to strange new places. But events that would come to light later on highlight that there were certainly issues within their group, but the real truth is something we'll probably never know. 
Dave would later claim that his self harming was ignored by his fellow bandmates. In a tweet, he mentioned that after he wrote a song in which he stated this fact, he was met by mockery and laughter by his bandmates. It's unknown if this means that they were aware and still made the jokes, or if they simply misinterpreted this cry for help for edgy lyrics. One of the most important things to understanding Boy in a Band is understanding his relationship with mental health. It's unknown how long before YouTube Dave had been struggling, but for as long as he's been a public figure, it's known he's suffered from primarily depression and likely a series of other conditions. The source of his depression isn't known, it doesn't even need to have a source, but its longevity throughout his career likely means it's in some way perpetuated by his fame and the pressures of being in the spotlight. However, as later information would claim, Dave wasn't always as responsible as he should have been in maintaining his own mental health, frequently misusing medication and not taking proper steps to care for himself. Now he was finally free of the band, Dave continued producing solo content on the Boy in a Band channel, consisting of him discussing various musical topics, doing epic and hilarious comedy skits, or the occasional iconic YouTube rap battle. Do you remember the Hobbit sister Don't you remember the Burdens of History? Yes, we do, but the precious cast is on the mask. And so would begin the solo YouTube career of Boy in a Band. In the early to mid 2010s, or prime YouTube as I'm sure many will refer to it, there wasn't really any other channel quite like Dave's. You had your gamers, your commentaries, your hey. eating vomit for views, but music was the one area where few others had been able to successfully break into. Something that isn't really discussed is the egregious state of YouTuber music in the early 2010s. It doesn't have the best reputation, like, like it, it was shitty, okay? Now I'm not talking about the few outlier channels or, or the songs that maybe maybe had a resurgence in recent years, you know, you know that's, that's nostalgia, okay? I'm talking about the 95% of bad Minecraft music videos, the, the, the rip-off epic rap battles and the channel anthems that random YouTubers would shit out just because they could. Just another day in the life of a troll. Even today, it's not uncommon for YouTubers to try and use their platform to kickstart a music career. Music is seen by many as the most lucrative and prestigious form of art in the modern age. You know, above the scum making their fucking little YouTube videos. So all you need is some capital and an overinflated ego from an online fan base, and boom, pure artistic bankruptcy. There's a reason few YouTubers successfully become musicians. Music isn't as easy as most think, and there are only a few who could proudly claim to be musicians on YouTube. And that's where Dave found his niche. Instead of being a YouTuber who wanted to make music, Dave was a musician by trade who had started to do YouTube. What was that, three tins of Quality Street? Oh, settle down, Dave. His exceptional music experience led him to create a pretty astonishing network of fellow YouTubers, both big and small, who sought out his musical know-how to create a project that, under his watchful eye, wouldn't be complete dog shit. The Gucci Hall is only one syllable, though, so I try and find some things that rhyme with Gucci with or instead of entitled. Oh my god, like that's that. legitimately something I would never would have thought of. Collaborations of this nature was the main way Dave got his name out there. If a YouTuber with little musical experience suddenly announced they were dropping a song, odds are Dave had his creamy little fingers in there somewhere. He would go to live in Brighton around this time. In the mid-2010s, Brighton, for some unknown fucking reason, became the hub of British YouTube, placing Dave in close proximity to some pretty famous characters. Oh yeah, I'll mention here, I know there's a stigma about growing your online channel through collaborations, at least from the fans of said channel. I appreciate if you really like a YouTuber and respect their craft, it, it could be insulting to hear someone say that they only got to where they are on the backs of others. But for Dave, you really can't deny the impact collaborations had on his channel. Now that's not to say he didn't put in work, he clearly knows how to shit out a well-made project. And some of his most famous videos were original ventures conceived and produced by him alone. One of the first of these collaborations would be with fellow Brit Emma Blackery, where he remixed one of her songs titled The Promise, with Emma herself in the video providing vocals. Oh look, you can download the mp3 from the description, epic win. Let me, let me grab my iPod Touch. With this song and his later projects, we're first introduced to a common topic seen in most of his work, a, a unifying theme if you will, and that's mental health and the issues surrounding it. This will be more important later on, but for the time being it's worth remembering Dave was creating a platform 
platform for mental health awareness that spoke to his fan base that then would have consisted of many young people. For many, Dave was a voice for the voiceless, a shy little emo guy who was just like them. This was also before the big cultural shift of 2016 to 2020. Issues like gender and mental health weren't really talked about in any meaningful way. There, there were exceptions, definitely, but Dave really was at the forefront of this kind of social progression. So because of this, Dave had a fan base that was both very young and very old. Concerning his private life, Dave was polyamorous by his own admission, meaning he was in relationships that involved multiple romantic partners. Dave would often relate to his fans, speaking about the challenges that faced young people with non-conventional conventional lifestyles. One song he made was all about the hate he had received throughout his life for his unconventional appearance, and that regular guys are just intimidated by him because he, he's so brave and, and cool. If I'm so sure of myself that I'm practically reaching Nirvana, you're that guy that says no homo after he eats a banana. I got that confidence that only comes with competence, but judging from your comments you've got some internal conflict. And, and he doesn't care about their insults. That's why he made a five minute rap video talking about how much he does not care about their insults. Why do you keep bringing up their insults? He doesn't care. Stop asking about their insults. Yeah, he uses the F slur in the first word of the song. <laughs> hey, fa In February of 2015, Dave would upload probably his most well-known musical project to date. Since childhood, Dave had allowed his hatred of school to fester inside him, seething about the education system and how little it had prepared him for the real world. Well, no longer would he keep these thoughts to himself. Don't Stay in School is a three-minute musical adventure where Dave laments the modern education system and outlines all the useless crap we were taught, as well as proposing some more useful information that would be more applicable to modern life. To say the song blew up doesn't really do it justice. For a few weeks, it completely took YouTube by storm and created a pretty substantial conversation online about the merits and pitfalls of school. There are now literally thousands of reaction videos wherein most people agree with him, probably making some empty remark about how yeah yeah school is useless yeah yeah he he's spitting facts sorry i'm being i'm being too harsh <laughs> the most popular of these reactions were obviously the fine brothers breaking into a nursing home and any video that purported to have a teacher agreeing with the thesis of the song he's not wrong even up until today with everything that's happened to boy in a band the song still seems to be positively regarded with the occasional reaction and breakdown still making its way onto the site personally i feel the song maybe isn't the most logically sound. I remember when it first came out and, and like this shit was fire. Like I'm sure when it was first released, many young people were anticipating a full scale education reform led by this geezer. But as I've aged and been embittened by the world, I can't help but see a few logical flaws in the song. Never spent a lesson on current events. Instead, I studied the old American West. Right, so this is like a borderline Jaden Smith. Like, he's talking about how learning about history is useless. Like, David, I, I think I think maybe there's some history that might be uh, might be pertinent to teach children. I spent a lesson on current events. Instead, I studied- Slavery. Another video he would put up that holds the record for the most terribly aged content of all time goes to this video where Dave basically spends 13 minutes figuratively sucking off actual child slave owner Elon Musk. So who is this superhero that's saving us from the brink of collapse? There was a genius billionaire in that picture, but it wasn't Robert Downey Jr. The dude chilling with Tony Stark was- Adolf Hitler! Gr granted, it was made well before the public realized what a colossal scrot Elon is, but, but the fact this is still up, just- Man. <laughs> okay, let's do a quick side quest. Dave's sister, Hannah, in 2011 would create a YouTube channel of her own called White English Girl, where she would upload videos relating to Japan and Japanese language learning. That name, man, like, I, li I like it, it's straight to the point. She started out with musical content in a similar vein to Boy in a Band. And some of these names, like, is, is this satire? <laughs> Regardless, like, it's funny. She did a lot of videos rapping in Japanese, you know, I don't know what the fuck she's saying, but you know, she, she spit. <laughs> Dave frequently featured on the channel, around 2016 appearing in a majority of her videos, even as she moved away from musical content in favour of vlogs and challenge videos. She amassed almost 50,000 subscribers, whilst a fraction of her brother's following, it's still nothing to scoff at. But in early 2018, she would cease uploading, with a vlog of her and Dave exploring Harajuku being the last piece of content posted before the channel went dark. 
In September of 2015, Dave would go on a hiatus for almost a year, returning on August 10th, 2016 to mass rejoicing. For the next year, he would settle into his usual routine of music slash comedy. In July of 2017, he would even appear on Glam and Gore's YouTube channel. Ooh, it's another connection. It's the Node Armstrong cinematic universe, baby. In October of 2017, Dave would participate in his most high profile and controversial collaboration. Ian Washburn would travel to Brighton, England, and the two would write and record the diss track slash diss track parody, Asian Jake Paul, for Ian's upcoming content cop on controversial YouTube Brian Lee. Unfortunately, this content cop would be deleted, so all we have left are um, some 240p re-uploads. David featured heavily in the song, dropping some bars, as, as the youngsters might say. Woo! You've been pretending ever since your little rice balls descended. Like kids think you did it all when you weren't capable of making a playground insult. This performance was the most outwardly hostile we had ever seen him, as this was the first instance of David ever involving himself in YouTube drama. As for what he actually said, or, or rapped, I mean, it wasn't that bad. He calls Brian narcissistic and selfish, insults that would be validated by Ian's video that predicated the music video. Nonetheless, later that October, he posted a pseudo-apology in which he expresses regret for some of the things he said and takes responsibility for negative comments his words had inadvertently encouraged. I don't really think it warranted this much hate, and I want to take responsibility for my actions here. He travelled to LA to make his apology in person, and he finally made contact, and, and oh, it was Casey Neistat all along. Oh, he fooled us, what a prank. Oh, 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 ha, ha. At the start of 2018, Dave would go on hiatus from making videos for a few months, returning in late April with a badass new look. Yar, what a scurvy sea dog. Oh, he dyed his little beard like his hair, now, now that is fun. Y yeah, the backlash to the beard was expected. Allegedly, it was all a bit. Yeah, yeah, Dave's a bit of a comedian, it seems. I do like it. Why? Because it makes you look stupid. <laughs> Why? He's he's a regular and practical joker once he gets his hands on the beard dye. Look, we can't both look like this. It's been ages since you've been on my channel. They don't remember you. People are just gonna think you're me in a stupid hat. Mate, if I was just you in a hat, how could I do this? <laughs> Jesus. I like to think Dave secretly recorded two videos, like like one for if people hate the beard, he just makes jokes and self-deprecates, and one where if people like it, it's just him unedited for five minutes reading his manifesto. The age of consent is just too darn high. It lasted all of two weeks before it was shaved off in a video titled Shaving My Beard and Describing My Crippling Depression. <laughs> After this debacle, Dave would travel to Cali and attend VidCon in 2018, where he did whatever a YouTuber does at VidCon. I'm assuming taking a lot of photos with fans, as well as Roman-style orgies in the hotel penthouse. While he was here, he got a chance to meet up with various YouTubers he had befriended online, and as a result, he began to plan multiple musical collaborations with them. And most of these YouTubers would exist within the then-exclusive animation storytime community. So the next few months mark the period I refer to as the big string of animation collaboration. But don't let the whimsical name fool you though, these songs were depressing. The first of which being with Jaden Ditfak, aka Jaden Animations, with the song morbidly titled Empty. They weren't exactly subtle with the fact that it was about anorexia and bulimia. Every single lyric is some kind of food or body related double entendre. Upon release, the song was praised both artistically and technically, with people mainly applauding Jaden's honesty and bravery. For the video to accompany the song, they interspliced scenes of Dave and Jaden singing their respective verses in a void with dramatic segments of Jaden refusing to eat a sandwich and weighing herself and crying. It's very edgy, but it certainly gets the point across. Jaden deleted the official version in the wake of the later 2022 drama, so currently only re-uploads exist. To coincide with the release of the song, Dave posted the official behind the scenes on his own channel, which is still available to watch. Hey, Jaden. <laughs> <laughs> to make the song, Dave traveled to Arizona to meet with her, and whilst in the state, would also team up with another famous Arizona resident. He would team up with famous child entertainer. <laughs> He would team up with famous child entertainer Robert Rallison, and the two of them would create the song Life Is Fun. Because James's audience weren't old enough to understand serious topics, they decided to make a wacky comedy song where James sings about how happy he is, and Dave, in response, sings about how bad things are. I could be like the sunshine, and you could be like the sun's going to explode. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, Ooh, I feel like we could talk about like racism. I that could be one of like the negative thoughts. Thanks for clarifying that, James. Like, oh, like I worked hard to get this job. Like, statistically, people with 
white yeah. names so more oh, yeah, yeah. old and black names and stuff like that. But now Dave was hungry for a bigger challenge. A bigger fish, and what he caught, oh, oh, was the biggest of them all. Felix Schelberg, aka PewDiePie, was at the time the largest YouTuber on the site. However, after a long publicity campaign to remain on top, the writing was on the wall, and it was clear he was soon to be overtaken by Indian media giant T-Series. So in preparation for this loss, he brought in David as well as another musical YouTuber and fellow Swede, Rumi. They would create the song Congratulations, which was immensely popular on the website, and saw everyone involved receiving praise for making such a catchy song. But to my surprise, Dave didn't come out of this completely scot-free. Another music YouTuber, Sean Alika, who had known Dave intimately sometime in the past, came out with a diss track on him, named Dissing My Ex, where they would scold Dave for collaborating with PewDiePie. But I guess it's not my place, so baby doll, um, I don't wanna make you sad, but platforming the alt-right is really, really Thanks for your opinion, end of conversation And after that you were even more mysteriously silent What the fuck? Dave standing up to blatant misinformation? Is this the rare boy in a band W? Okay, but seriously, I can, I can understand why they may have had some concerns. Back in the distant past of 2018, Felix was a far more divisive figure politically. It had only been a few months since the iconic bridge incident had taken place. What a fucking nick. And he had also controversially partnered with Ben Shapiro for one of his videos. So PewDiePie asked me to review some memes. Memes are this thing where people put funny stuff on my phone. Sean Alika had apparently reached out to David, imploring him to not associate with Felix, claiming that by doing so, he would be contributing to transphobia, and that despite claiming he was an LGBTQ ally, Dave had sold out his beliefs for fame. Their video was hit with an iconic negative like to dislike ratio. Most likely this all came from Dave's diehard fan base. But surprise, surprise, after recent events, everyone has started commenting positive things. And that brings us into 2019. This year is marked by Dave putting less focus on outputting music in favor of more traditional YouTube content. He would collaborate frequently, primarily with Rumi, and the two of them would last be seen in a Google Feud video. Well, what the fuck is that? As most already knew, David had reoccurring struggles with mental health, and around the time he stopped uploading, it's likely he was no longer able to balance his mental health with a full-time YouTube career. It's possible that the stress of being a public figure is what caused this decline, but regardless, many would begin to speculate over whether David had quit YouTube and music altogether. From previous comments, one wouldn't think so. He had casually mentioned his intention to continue certain projects into 2020, and his Instagram and Twitter remained active. Via community posts, he would inform his fans of how severe his depression had gotten, and how lonely he was feeling due to the pandemic, and also that the new medicine he was on had totally thrown off his sleep pattern. He then said he was getting therapy Therapy, which would seem like a positive development, but he then went on to ask fans via a poll if he should take all of his medicine at once to, and I quote, speed up the effects. People overwhelmingly voted in favour of following the recommended dosage, and keep in mind the internet is known to do a little bit of trolling, especially when it comes to polls. So people telling him not to take it all at once shows that even if he was joking, there was some genuine concern that in his current state he may just down them all at once. Even back in 2020, Dave was still well into his 30s. So what we're seeing here here is a 30 year old man announcing his depression to a fan base of teenagers. And whilst you can choose to view this as him destigmatizing mental health and just being open, people with one foot in reality can clearly see this as him trying to garner sympathy and attention from his fans. I can't emphasize enough how terrible it is to put the burden of your mental health onto your fan base. David, or any YouTuber for that matter, is, is not your friend and you are not close to them. I doubt that Dave was worried about the mental health of his fans. The only reason he needed them was to comment positive things under his cries for attention. For the next year, we would get an occasional depressing tweet or social media update, obviously bringing up the same issues of oversharing that I just covered. But for his online presence, that would be it. The last confirmed visual sighting we would get can be found in a Rumi video titled Rumi and Dave 504, our wedding video. Oh look, he tried the beard again. Second time's the charm, Dave. As the months passed and he drifted further and further into the distant annals of YouTube, it seemed like he was destined to be a tragic memory. A unique creative who took the bold choice to prioritize himself and his own mental health over internet fame. But in 2022, that would all change. So for many, this is the legacy Boy in a Band has left in their minds, and the legacy David Paul Brown will leave on this earth. 
I'm of course referring to the infamous letter released in August of 2022, and the enclosed allegations that claimed David had on multiple occasions groomed underage fans and abused multiple ex-partners. Written collectively by a group of women large enough that it was in the double digits, it was originally sent to Dave's family, presumably with the intention being to keep this drama off the internet for the sake of David, and of course to maintain the privacy of his victims. Evidently, these attempts to keep things private were unsuccessful, exactly why or in what capacity they were unsuccessful is unknown. With no other option, the letter was posted on the Boy in a Band subreddit, where it remained up for some time. However, since has either been removed or voluntarily taken down. But thankfully, it was saved and can still be easily found. I'm going to be controversial here and emphasize that everything I'm about to say is alleged as of September 2023. I'm not dismissing any claims, but I think I have a duty here to say that nothing in the letter can be verified. Now, again, I'm not trying to dismiss the claims of the victims. After I've discussed the contents of the letter, I'll go into why their claims seem somewhat plausible. But what exactly was in the letters themselves? I won't read the entire thing, so I'll just list off the key points in order of severity from most severe to least. The worst thing mentioned by far was his hebophilia. This is sexual attraction to teenagers, and it's also the accusation with the most solid evidence to support it. Dave had frequently dated girls who were significantly younger than him, at one point showing off his 17-year-old girlfriend in a video, when he was 23 at the time. First, I guess you need to find a vocalist. For my vocalist, I woke up next to her and figured, yeah, yeah, she'll do, which as I understand it, is the usual method a record label executive will use to pick a pop star. Yeah, Dave, mate, let's not let's not brag about banging 17-year-olds. In the UK, whilst not illegal, this kind of relationship is very... Eh. The law's pretty shaky on this. The issue with the age difference between him and his partners is that with such large gaps, this gave Dave inherent dominance over his partner. A dominance which apparently he was pretty happy to flex. His hebophilia is also linked to what is described as a porn addiction. How people came to know of his porn addiction is unknown, but apparently it manifested with him viewing pornography where individuals dressed to appear like preteens. It's unknown if any such materials were provably illegal. They don't seem to be pulling any punches, so it can be assumed that if he actually was viewing anything that could be considered illegal, they would have made it known. Clarification, I'm not trying to exonerate Boy in a Band for this. This is immensely fucking creepy regardless. You know, you know, lollicon fans when I show them a perfect sketch of their house and all of a sudden it isn't just a drawing. Now, that's a joke, by the way. I'm not, I'm not threatening to go to anyone's house. The next key issue was instances of physical abuse and manipulation. It's only pretty recently that people have become more aware of the dangers of parasocial relationships and how certain individuals are able to irresponsibly foster disproportionate adoration from their followers. As mentioned before, David would apparently use his mental health as leverage. As a partner, that's an incredibly difficult position to be in. Strangely enough, the term financial abuse is also used. This most likely could refer to situations where Dave, being pretty well off, could trap partners via their financial dependence on him. It was stated he would rent Airbnbs to meet with his partner partners, so assuming he was in control of where they were staying, the financial manipulation thing could start to make sense. He would apparently target younger women who were students, favouring those who had little money or influence, and could therefore be even more easily manipulated. Now, just knowing this, you could be forgiven for feeling bad for Dave in what seems to be quite a deep pit of mental illness and substance abuse, leading to him acting in such an unacceptable way. But according to his victims, he had the self-awareness and guile to spin his mental illness for sympathy and weaponize it against his partners. By claiming he only acted the way he did as a result of his depression, he could flip the guilt from himself onto his partners, as they couldn't be angry at a man who's fighting such a challenging mental battle. It's a sad truth that mental illness can be weaponized just as easily as it can destroy someone. I think most people have at some point been guilt-tripped or made to feel like the problem as a result of someone lashing out due to emotional struggle. And it's important to acknowledge when it's not your responsibility anymore. Dave's actions here, whilst maybe not intentionally malicious, are still his and only his fault. You just have to look at his last community post to see this in action. His fans don't need to know this. Dave will not gain anything from interacting with his fans in this manner. His bandmates, as mentioned earlier, may also be victims of this effect. Claiming they ignored his self-harm completely removes the idea that maybe they themselves were struggling with issues that Dave wasn't aware of, and also creates the weird idea that they have a responsibility for Dave's mental health. They're his friends, sure, but they don't have a responsibility for Dave's mental health. Boy in a band? More like boy in a van. Po police van. 
can, that is. Sorry, sorry, that's not, that's not funny. This is very serious. As mentioned before, David took medication for various mental issues. And according to the letter, he would frequently misuse this medication in conjunction with various narcotics. Mainly cannabis and whiskey. I don't think it really needs to be explained how disastrous it can be to mix antidepressants with basically anything. And by doing such, Dave was being incredibly irresponsible, endangering himself and those around him. This is put forward as the key reason why over the past few years, his mental health as a whole has not been seeing any improvement, even with the help of therapy, as ultimately he was afraid of coming to terms with who he actually is and the things he's done. Now, the allegations were met with a fair degree of skepticism. As said, they don't appear to include anything provably criminal, and fans of David were quick to point out the potential potholes in the accuser's story. Bizarrely, Rachel, who was Dave's underage girlfriend who sang the rape lyric, was totally unaware of her details being used in the letter. The original poster claimed they had her permission, but sources say she had to reach out and request the info revealing her identity be redacted. Equally as sus was the account the letter was posted using. It seems to be a burner account that was soon after abandoned, and only adds to the mystery of who any of these individuals were. There were also some chat messages purportedly sent by some of his victims, but these are unverifiable and have generally been dismissed as such. Looking at his last post on Twitter, you can see a pretty solid split between the positive affirming comments made before the letter was published and all the fucking shitty memes posted after. There doesn't seem to be a massive demand for Dave to return, and even if he did, it's unlikely anyone aside from his close friends would want to associate with such a controversial figure. Even his own Reddit is locked by the moderators. And this isn't even in an attempt to protect Dave. The last few posts are about the allegations and him saying the gamer word. I think the moderators just wanted to wipe their hands of any boy in a band association. No legal action has been taken by Dave or the accusers, meaning either something was settled privately or the destruction of his public image was a reward in itself. So since the allegations, Dave has done a remarkable job of hiding himself from the internet. Despite all of my researching, the only info I could find were rumours of his whereabouts. Some believing he's currently living in LA, working behind the scenes for a YouTuber. Personally, I think he's still in the UK. Probably in Brighton, that's a punishment in itself. <laughs> We don't know for certain how he's making money, or if his mental health has seen any improvement since his departure from the public eye. But whatever you think of him and the things he's done, I'm sure you can agree with me when I say, I hope he's doing better. When most public figures are hit with allegations, the usual impulse is to revel in the decline of someone who was until recently wealthier and more popular than us. But concerning the fall of Boy in a Band, it's hard to milk any entertainment or catharsis from the situation. The unknown victims will likely remain silent, so we'll never know the lengths and depths of David's transgressions. Transgress- 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 <laughs> Fuck it. And Dave himself is unlikely to ever come forward and try to prove his innocence. If he has any innocence to spare, that is. Is it likely we'll see Dave return? Honestly, I don't think so. Even if he's just biding his time, waiting for the drama to die down, the internet doesn't forget, and it doesn't forgive. Without a thorough debunking of the letter and his accusers, any return he attempts to make would be shot down immediately. And whilst I'm sure there are still a few diehard stands who to this day regard him as flawless, the YouTube community at large sees him more as a punchline than anything else. Man, how do we, how do we salvage a closing message from this? Um, uh, don't live in Brighton. Thank you so much for watching. Um, this, this video was an absolute fucking nightmare to shit out. Um, I got loads more crap like this on the way, so if, if you want to stick around for that, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe consider subscribing, you know. Because remember, you're not just a subscriber, you're also one of my most personal friends. You wouldn't want to let me down, would you? You wouldn't want to let down a friend. <laughs> I think we should end the video now. I play Fortnite with Koreans.